OK, I will record every lecture and then upload it to YouTube and then I will post the YouTube link uh, onto Moodle. So if you miss a class for any reason or you fall asleep or something, uh, you can always go home and rewatch the part that you missed. OK, let's look at the syllabus. This is what we're going to be doing this semester. First week, introduction to the course. I'm doing that right now. And then I will talk about the Middle Ages, the 16th century, and our first author for next week, Philip Sidney. So as I said, this is a history course. We are going to be looking at literary history. Literary history is divided into periods, shiqi. And the idea is that each period has different values that people think are important. And that there are changes from the previous period. So after period after period, uh, by the time we get to today, the people of today will be building on the past ways of thinking. So we're going to move through British literary history period by period. Each period is around 100 years, more or less. Uh, and usually uh, British literature is divided into, let's see, the Middle Ages, 16th century, 17th century, 18th, Romanticism, Victorianism, 20th, seven periods. Um, now, you, you may have noticed some of these are named after the year, right? 16th century. That's, it sounds like it's from 1501 to 1600, but that's not true. Literary periods, even if their name is a number, sorry, even if the name of a literary period is a number, it may not be exactly the same as the calendar. It's simply a name. So for example, the 16th century is from 1485 to 1601, right? Not exactly the same. Um, and then you will notice that this week I will introduce two periods instead of one. And this is because we're not going to read anything from the Middle Ages, Zhong Siji. There are a few reasons. One, most of it is either very long or very boring, or both. Uh, and also, uh, most of it is in translation, Fan Yi, because the English of the Middle Ages is so different from modern English that most people can't read it. So I think it's not worth spending one or two weeks reading something that is boring and hard and that you can't finish. Um, I will just explain to you what's going on in the Middle Ages. So the first thing you're going to be reading is from the 16th century. Uh, so after introducing everything today, next week we will talk about uh, the work of Philip Sidney. And then I will introduce Shakespeare. He also belongs to the 16th century. Um, but next week, I will also be introducing the 17th century even before you read Shakespeare. And um, I'm sorry about this because in week four, we won't have time to explain the 17th century because you will be taking Oh, maybe you will be taking an English proficiency test from our department. I think we're still talking about um, which class it's going to use. But if we use this class to take that exam, it will be on week four. I'll tell you next week. Week three, no class. Uh, and then uh, we're going to spend one week on the 17th century. I will introduce you to the 18th century. And then week six will be, I think, the hardest thing you have to read this semester. The thing about the 18th century 
is that this is the beginning of the English essay, Sanwen. So I can't just give you like a short poem. To really represent the ideas and culture of the period, it has to be an essay. So it will be longer, there will be more words, and it will still be written in an older kind of English. So uh, I want you to be prepared for week six. Uh, then I will introduce you to the Romantic period, which is the most, I think the most important period in British literary history. We're going to be spending two weeks on the Romantic period. And on week eight, I will also explain the midterm exam. I'll tell you more about the exam later, but the idea is um, the exam is a take home open book Essay question. 带回家开书考的申论题. And I will give you one week to answer the question. So the ex midterm exam will begin after class on week eight and will end at midnight on week nine. So because you are um, well, the original design is that you don't have to do too much during the exam, but there's a schedule issue, so you do have to do something. While you are taking the exam, you also have to read uh, these two poems to prepare for week nine. And again, I'm sorry about this. And this is because week 10 is a field trip. Shall I tell you? You know that to graduate, from the Applied English Department, you have to write a graduation thesis, Part of that process is you have to present your work uh, on stage to an audience. And our department is making everybody present their work on that day, November 17. Now, you don't have to write a graduation thesis yet, but I have students who do. So when they present, I have to be there. So we, we can't have a class. At the same time, the department is not letting us uh, change the day of the class. So we have to have a class, but I can't be there. So the answer is you guys have to come find me. So everybody is going to go to the graduation thesis presentation as a field trip, shall I judge it? Um, if you can't make it, I won't force you. Just take leave uh, through the school system. Um, I'll talk a bit more about this. No, I'm going to talk about this now. OK, so. Um, in order to. Let's see. OK, that day I will be very busy. I won't be able to like lead you around. So to make sure that you did come, I'm going to ask you to upload some reflections, Xingde, and I will actually read them, and I will actually check if you did come or not. Those reflections will be your attendance for that day. Okay? Okay. So continuing, then we're moving into the Victorian era. Um, these are all still poems. And then in week 11, I will introduce you to the 20th century. Now, as I just said, th some of these literary periods don't match the calendar. The 20th century literary period begins in 1914 and is still going. I know we're in the 21st century, but history takes some time to settle. So currently, historians are still discussing when does the literary 21st century begin? And since there's no answer, I'm not going to try to give you one. We're just going to pretend that we're still in the 20th century. So this will be the last uh, literary period. That's right, we're going to spend six weeks in the 20th century. This is good for you because the 20th century uses more modern English. It should be easier to understand. 
Um, week 12, we're going to be reading one long poem. And then uh, week starting from week 15 this week, these are two short stories. Week 16, we're going to be reading two essays. And then week 17, we're going to be reading some more poetry. Week 17, I will also introduce the final exam and the final exam will begin after class on week 17 and end at midnight on uh, week 18 Friday. Uh, but we still have to come to class on week 18, so I'm just going to show you a movie. OK, do you have questions about the schedule? Right. In just in case you didn't know, this semester there will not be a coordinated midterm or final week. So week nine and week 18, you still have to come to class. OK, so that's the syllabus. Next, we have class emails. I will try to tell you all of the important information during class, but if something happens during the week and you have to know, I will post something here and the system will send an email to your school email account at me.mcu, that one. Now, I know that not everybody looks at your school email, so when I do post something, I will update this part. It will say latest and then the date and the subject line. So uh, remember to come check here from time to time to see if there is some important message that you have to know. OK, next, this is where you will submit your field trip reflections. Uh, and you will have one and a half days to do this. You can only submit a PDF file. Next, attendance. This is where I will input your attendance grade. You can't see this. I hid this from you. Oh, I should also tell you how much is attendance, right? This is important. OK, grading. Blah, blah, blah. Here. Midterm exam 25%, final exam 25%, attendance 50%. Um, so you know that if you miss seven weeks of class, the system will fail you automatically. I can't change that. You know this, right? So it doesn't make sense for the attendance grade to look at all 18 weeks. Because after you miss seven weeks, it doesn't matter. So the attendance will only look at the first uh, six weeks that you miss class. So let's see, 50% divided by six. That's OK. So every time you miss one week of class for no reason, I will take away nine points from your total score. If you get sick, you can take leave. If you have an emergency, you can apply for personal leave. Right, that's fine. But if you simply wake up at 2 p.m. and decide you're not going to come, I'm going to take away nine points from your final grade. Okay, so that's that. No, I, there's one more thing I wanted to show you. Uh, we've been talking a lot about you have to read this, read that. It may be hard, whatever. But really, as long as you come to class and you follow the exam rules, which I will explain later, you'll do fine. I'm, I will try my best to help you pass. And if you don't pass, we're going to see each other next year. OK, this next thing is a YouTube video. So the reason I upload the video to YouTube instead of directly onto Moodle is because YouTube produces a transcript, 逐字稿, 
and you can search that transcript. So if you missed only one part of class, or you want to rewatch one part, you don't have to look through the whole video. Just open the transcript, search for a keyword, and it will take you to that part of the video. Uh, and if you need to learn how to do this, you can watch this video. Uh, OK, this next thing uh, is an essay about why we should study literature. Some of you might be wondering, I came to an applied English department. Why am I still reading literature? Uh, and there are a number of good reasons why even here we should study some literature. Uh, it can help you see different perspectives. It can train your empathy, which eh, maybe, maybe not. And um, it can help you prepare for different situations in your life. I think for all of you, your life is not yet even at one fourth. Life can be very long. Many different things can happen. And a lot of those things will be pretty shitty. Uh, people will go away. People will die. Pets will die. People will betray you. You will accidentally hurt other people. Many different things will happen. Literature is written by people who have experienced some of the most powerful things in life and they wanted to express that idea and to write it down. So by reading literature, it's like you get a, a plan or a cheat code for how life might turn out. Of course, every life is different, but in every life there will be some things that are very similar. And reading literature can help you prepare for that. Even if it's from 500 years ago. And then finally, uh, studies have shown that people who read literature have a bigger vocabulary and better language skills. So if you do uh, successfully absorb literature in this class, your English should also improve. So that's good, right? Uh, and if you're interested in this topic, you can read more in this essay. It's in Chinese. OK, and then these two. So every week, uh, sorry, every literary period, I will first introduce some important events. Um, if you don't want to flip through the handout to find that page, I have collected all of those introductions in this file. Now, um, in the textbook, every author also has their own introduction, but I didn't want to give you like 200 pages. Instead, I would just introduce each author to you. But if you want to read in more detail, I have collected all of those introductions in this file. So if you're interested, you can read these. OK, next, um, the handouts have been divided into two halves because the school says I cannot print more than 50 pages at a time. So I had to cut it in half somewhere. Uh, so the first half is the range for the midterm exam, and the second half is the range for the final exam. This file is the handout, so if you forget your handout, or you don't need a paper copy, you can download it from Moodle. After that, these are each week's discussion questions. I've already prepared all of the questions. So if you're reading and you don't really understand what's going on, or you get lost, or you're not sure why we're reading something, you can look at these discussion questions. As I said, I uh, wrote open questions. These are the parts of each literary work that I think are the most interesting, the most important, or the thing that I think would be uh, most interesting to talk about. So um, 
if you need some kind of guidance, if you need someone to help you lead the way, you can look at these questions while you read. OK, next is the exam area. Um, some of you may not have experience with essay questions, so uh, after these rules, below here I have given you some example answers to other essay questions, not our questions, right? Because that would be too easy. Uh, so even though these are answering other questions, the way that the answer is written, I think is good. It's something that you can learn from. Specifically, um, the essay questions are also open questions. Those are kai fangti. There's no right or wrong answer. Um, it depends on how you support your answer. I'll, I'll tell you the, the question right now. OK, here is your midterm question and final question. I will give you a work of literature. I will tell you which period it is from. For example, like I'll give you a poem and say this poem was written in the 16th century. The question is. Why? How can you tell? And so I want you to give me reasons why you can see that this poem is from the 16th century. So how will I grade your answer? Everyone's answers will be a little bit different. I will grade your answers based on how you use the evidence, how you support the idea. Here. Your answer. Now let's give the whole thing. Your answer must give specific evidence from at least four different points in the assigned text, not just for examples. So in the past, I have had some very clever students use one example and explain it in four different ways. That doesn't work. Please give me four examples from different parts of the text. When you give this uh, evidence and you explain why this part fits with the literary period, Please give me the page number if it's more than one page. Or the line number, hang shu, if it's a poem. That way I know that you're really looking at the text and you're not just trying to remember or you're not like copying something from ChatGPT. Now, they are all open book. So you can look at the handout, you can look at your notes. You can rewatch these videos that I will post on YouTube. The only thing you cannot do, the only thing you cannot do is talk to other people about the exam. I want your ideas. I want to see how you take information, organize it into the answer or your answer. Uh, but there is one exception. You can talk to me. Because I'm the person who wrote the exam, so I can I can tell whether uh, I'm giving you too much information or not. Right in the past, students have actually asked me, uh, can, does this answer make sense or can I do that? And I have given answers. Um, I do this because I was inspired by one of my own college professors. Uh, I was taking linguistics, which you are going to find out is not very easy. Uh, it was not easy for us either. And the professor knew that. He knew that we were struggling. So for the exams, uh, he was sitting in front and we were like uh, doing the exams. And he said, if you have any questions, just ask me. So one student, not me, raised his hand and asked the professor, Professor, how do we do question one? And the professor said, come here, I'll show you. And so the student brought his exam to the front and the professor showed him how to do question one. 
I'm not going to show you how to do the question, but I will do everything except that. So if you're really stuck and you really don't know what to do, feel free to ask me for help. Now, open book means you can also look for information from other sources. You can go to the library. You can use the Internet. But if you use information from other sources, you have to let me know. Tell me what is the source. Let me also be able to find it. If you use a website, give me the web address, Wangzi. If you use a, a, a book, give me the page number. If you use a video, give me the timestamp, next to each piece of information. So you cannot just give me the source at the bottom of your answer. You must give me the source for each individual piece of information. If you give me the sources at the bottom, I don't know which part of your answer is your idea and which part of your answer is somebody else's idea. Only if you tell me which parts are yours and which parts are not yours, can I give you a grade? So if you uh, put all your sources at the bottom, I will pretend that you did not answer the question. Um, and this is very important because in college, we care about more than just um, things and money. We also care about ideas. If you steal somebody else's money, it's not your money. And anything you buy using that money does not belong to you. In college, if you steal someone's ideas, anything you do with those ideas are not yours. If you steal somebody's ideas and you get a good grade, you have stolen a grade. If you use those grades and you graduate, you have stolen a degree, sure way. And if you use your degree to get a job, you have stolen a job. This is very serious. So you don't have to answer the question alone, but if you find information to help you, you have to tell me which parts of your answer are not yours and where did you find it. If you don't, it's called plagiarism, Uh, And if you are interested in learning more about why this is so important, here is an essay in Chinese. Uh, so the exams are ready. You can't see these, obviously, uh, until the exam begins. I'm going to remind you about these rules and give you more details before the exam. OK, up to this point, do you have questions? OK, one last thing. Please remember to keep up with your own grades. If near the end of the semester you realize you're probably not going to pass. You can consider doing this bonus assignment. This is if you do this successfully, your lowest grade will be 60 passing grade, or if you're in graduate school, 70 also a passing grade. Now, some people will look at this and think, oh, the professor doesn't want to fail anybody. He just needs some reason to get me pass. No. The thinking behind this is. If you have not tried to do anything in this course and therefore you are about to fail, I want to see you try to do at least one thing seriously. So I'm going to look at your answer and your answer must have 1000 meaningful English words or 2,000 meaningful English, uh, Chinese words. Meaningful means it has to say something, and it has to be related to your personal experience. 
Now, because this is the last chance, it's not easy. You have to read this and then write 1000 meaningful words of reflection. What is this? This is 25 pages of 1968 English. So it's not easy. I'm hoping that you will pass the course and you won't need to do this. Uh, but if you do have to do the bonus assignment, you can only submit in Word file. Now, uh, if you do have to do this assignment, beware of the Google Docs error. This is what I'm talking about. What's wrong with this picture? So, this picture has some problems, right? How many words are highlighted? And yet it says here five words. Because it's not counting the words, it's counting the letters. And this happens sometimes if you write in Google Docs and you save as a Word file. So Google Docs uh, Word So the way to avoid this is you can copy everything and then paste it into Word, or you can just use Microsoft Word to write your answer. But uh, if you do write in Google Docs, notice this problem, right? It counts letters. Also, what is this? This is not one word, right? There should be more in front of this S. Uh, and also this, right? This looks like expectations, but the first half has disappeared. The first half of this word is in the previous line over here. So part of this error is that it will cut words in the middle. Uh, and then finally, you can notice if it's this font, the error includes all three parts. So if you have to do the bonus assignment, be careful to avoid this problem. Otherwise, uh, it will tell you you wrote 1,000 words, but in fact, you only wrote 200. Okay, I think that's everything on Moodle. Do you have questions about the bonus assignment? Yes. Yes, so if you don't, okay, if your original score is passing and you do this bonus assignment and it is successful, your grade will be higher. Because, um, you know, some people, when they look at their grade and they guess how much they will get by the end, they guess wrong and they don't need to do this. But if you do it anyways, I want to give you some encouragement and feedback so you will get a higher grade. Okay, other questions? Okay, this is not, I know I said it's hard, but this is not punishment. I do think this is a very good essay that you can learn from. Uh, so even if you don't need to, you can still do the assignment or you can read it without doing the assignment if you're interested. OK, so that's the introduction to the course. Let's jump into the Middle Ages. Uh, and this is where I will pass out the handout. Uh,
So the first people to live in what is today known as the United Kingdom or England are the Welsh people, Wales人, right? Today the United Kingdom has four parts, right? England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. The original inhabitants were Welsh. Uh, and they are known as the Britons. And that's why uh, the adjective of England is sometimes British. It comes from this uh, name for the original inhabitants. In the year 43, I mean, there were important things before the year 43, but in terms of literary history, in the year 43, uh, the Romans invade. Uh, and they speak Latin. So after the Roman invasion, the important language of government is Latin. So uh, some scholars of British literature who focus on the Middle Ages will read literature in Latin. Now, in the year 43, Rome was a Christian country. So the Romans also brought Christianity to the British Isles. In the year 450, uh, another invasion happened. The Anglo-Saxons invaded. You don't really need to know the Chinese, right? It's the same thing. Um, these were Germanic people, uh, and they had their own uh, religion. So at this point, the people in charge were not Christians. And this is why uh, England is called England. It comes from this word, Anglo. The language that they spoke, today we call this Old English, Sangu Ingwen. Old English is completely different from modern English. You do have to use a dictionary. There's very little similarity. In fifty, uh, sorry, in five hundred ninety-seven, this dude, Saint Augustine of Canterbury, came to the British Isles, realized that nobody here is Christian, and he decided this has to change. So he began reconverting people back to Christianity, uh, and this is important because even today, the official religion of the UK is the Church of England which is a Christian church. Now, the first major work of literature is an oral epic called Beowulf. We're not sure when it was created, but the earliest copy we have comes from around the year 1000. This is actually quite interesting, this story. But it's very long, uh, so we're not going to read it. The story is basically Beowulf is a king. One day he gets attacked by a dragon, so he fights the dragon. Uh, he wins, but like the dragon gets away. So he goes to hunt down the dragon, and he finds the dragon, but he realizes that the dragon is a mother, and like she has little dragons, and so he's very conflicted. Should I take revenge or should I, you know, uh, preserve this dragon family? Uh, so it's actually quite interesting. There's a movie. The movie has nothing. It's very unsimilar to the story, but if you're interested, you can watch it. It's a Hollywood action movie. Let's take a 10 minute break. We'll continue when we come back.
OK, so the next important thing is in the year 1066, the British Isles get invaded again, this time by the Normans. The Normans are also a Germanic people. You remind me. They come from what today is uh, northern and western France. Uh, and so the language that they spoke, today we call this Anglo-Norman or Old French, Sangu uh, Fawen. And this is why a lot of words in English are actually very similar to French words. I, is anybody taking French? Okay, if you do take French, you will realize that uh, words that end in T-I-O-N, or ITY are basically the same as in French. There's actually a, a pattern that we can use. So if a word is more formal, or used by the government, right, more abstract than Xiang, these words will usually look more like French, more like Latin. But if the word is more personal, used in everyday life. Uh, those words will look more like German and Dutch, uh, because they will be coming from Old English instead of Old French. Uh, so, for example, um, the word nation, right? it's basically the same as in French and as in Latin. But the word country is uh, more like Dutch and German. And you can tell the difference, right? Nation is an abstract idea that you see in politics and government. Country is something that you would talk about in daily life with your friends and family. Uh, so it's a little bit different. Uh, and this is one reason why English can sometimes be hard to learn because it's based on so many different kinds of language and different cultures. Uh, and this is just the beginning, right? We've only seen two or three influences. Later on in the British Empire, wherever the British Empire goes, it picks up new language. Uh, that's in the 19th century. Um, in 1169, the Normans go on to invade Ireland. Now, Ireland is today not part of the UK, but in the past, it, it was the first English colony. Ireland. And the history of these two countries is connected in many different ways, including in literature. So uh, I will always mention if something important happens to Ireland. OK, in the 1200s, so this is the 13th century. The language has changed so much that it has become a new language, and we call this Middle English. It is possible to read Middle English without a dictionary. It's not easy but it's possible. Um, and so the most important author of Middle English is Geoffrey Chaucer, who died in 1400. We don't know when he was born. Um, but today, if you uh, study um, Middle English and the literature of the Middle Ages in English, you will read something by Chaucer. And if you read the original, it's possible to understand what he's saying. But of course, most people still choose to read a modern translation. Chaucer's most famous work of literature is called the Canterbury Tales. It's the story of around 108 pilgrims, and they have gathered together and they are going to the city of Canterbury because there is an important church there and they want to uh, to participate in a religious event at Canterbury. 
Now, along the way, they have to find some way not to feel too bored. So they agree that each person will tell a story. And so the original plan for this really long poem was that each of these people would have an introduction to let the reader know what kind of person they are, and then that person will tell a story. And that story will inspire another person to jump in, sometimes to agree, sometimes to disagree, sometimes for no reason. And then we will get an introduction to the second person, and the second person will tell a story, and so on. Each of these 108 people would be different. Uh, some would be high class, some would be low class, men, women, religious, uh, very not religious, peaceful or warriors, all kinds of people. And so uh, the Canterbury Tales would give us a picture of the people of England at that time. That was the plan, but Chaucer died uh, before finishing the Canterbury Tales. So we only have the first, I think, one third or one fourth of the whole thing. And yet even that part is very amazing because most people of the Middle Ages, when they write literature, it's religious or political. There's some idea that they want to promote. Chaucer just wanted to show us what life is like. Uh, and so it's the first, one of the first great works of Middle English, which we're not going to read. The first time I taught this course, I assigned a story from the Canterbury Tales, and the students did not really uh, like that. So we're not doing that. But if you're interested, you can track down a modern English version or a Chinese version. Uh, okay, and then in 1422 began the War of the Roses, Meigui Zanzen. I'm sure some of you have heard of this, maybe through Japanese manga. Uh, the War of the Roses is after the Hundred Years' War, Bainian Zanzen. The Hundred Years' War is more than a hundred years, and it's a war with uh, some kingdoms in what is today called France. The idea is that because uh, the English kings came from uh, the Anglo-Normans, the English and the French were actually distant family members. And so anytime a French king died, the English king would say, I should be the next king of France. And of course, usually that's just empty shouting. It's not serious. But then a king suddenly got very serious about this, gathered an army and invaded France. And that lasted for over a hundred years. Um, if you fight a war for a hundred years, you're going to lose a lot of people, you're going to spend a lot of money, and your country will become weaker. So uh, by the time the Hundred Years' War finally ended, and the English lost, and the king died, the country was weak, there's no central power, and two parts of the royal family each thought that they should be the next king. So this is the House of Lancaster and the House of York. Each is represented by a different color of rose, Hong Meigui and Bai Meigui. Uh, and they fought until 1485. The way that this war ended is kind of stupid. Um, basically, both sides uh, killed off all of the men. And so in order to save both sides, they decided to marry the last two, like the, the last man with one of the women, and they combined both houses to create the House of Tudor, Du Duo Wang Cao. Uh, and then that is the end of the Middle Ages, and it moves us into the 16th century. Uh, but before that happened, one final thing is very important for uh, literary history. William Caxton in, uh, invents movable type printing, So before this, if you wanted to print something, you had to get a new sheet of metal, carve all of the words into the metal, print one page, 
and then do the same thing again for the second page for the third page. Very hard to do, takes a lot of time and effort. And if you make a mistake, you have to start over. But once Cacton invented movable type, it's not one sheet of metal. It's each letter is one block. And so if you need to print the next page, you just take those letters and rearrange them into the next page. Much faster. If you make a mistake, much easier to correct. And so this helped to promote the printing of what people thought was important. And what did people think was important? The Bible. So one of the first things that Caxton printed was a version of the Bible. Um, do you guys want to read the Bible? No? OK, so forget it. Um, if you do want to read the Bible, well, no, that should be in freshman year, right? Anyway, you can always find a copy of the Bible to read by yourself. OK, do you have questions about the Middle Ages? If not, we're moving on to the 16th century. Next page. This goes from 1485 to 1603. Uh, begins with the reign of Henry the Eight, uh, the Seventh, and because this is the end of hundreds of years of war, we finally get a strong king who everybody agrees should be king. So, like people can stop fighting and they can start doing other things, and other things means trading, economy, politics developing the country, all good stuff. So the beginning of Henry VII's reign is marked by a more stable court politics and a more stable group of politicians. Now, in a kingdom, there's only one person that matters, right? The king. So when I say politicians, today politicians try to win your votes, try to stay in power, but in those days, power was the king. So a politician tried to remain close to the king and get the king to ask them for advice. So these people are called courtiers, comes from the word court, gongting, people of the court. Most of these people were in the royal family. Sometimes you get somebody who is not from the royal family, uh, who did something very important or who somehow got a lot of power some other way, and they would also be part of the court. You would also have people from other countries like ambassadors, uh, would be considered part of the court also. In 1509, Henry VII dies, his son becomes Henry VIII. Not too important. Well, no, 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 no. Henry VIII is very important. Sorry. Um, for a reason we will talk about a bit later. In 1516, a very important work of literature is published, Utopia, Utobang, by Thomas More. You've probably heard this word before, right? It means like a perfect society, right? You probably didn't know it was a book. So Thomas More uh, wrote down his ideas about what he thinks would be a perfect society. That's one half of the book, and this is where it gets interesting. The other half of the book is his friend argues with him about why this is not a good society. So even from the beginning, the idea of utopia is not a simple perfect society. It's more like a debate about what is the perfect society. Uh, and at this time, the lingua franca, Guoji Tongxing Yuan, is Latin. So Utopia was written in Latin and only later translated back into English. Um, English would not become an important language until uh, the middle or nearing the end of the 16th century. But it turned into an important language because of 
the idea of Renaissance humanism, Wen Yi Fu Xing, Ren Wen Zhu Yi. So uh, traditionally, the culture revolved around religion and who is the king uh, and things going on across Europe, which at the time was the Western world. Humanism is the idea that maybe that's not the only thing that is important. Maybe our individual experiences that are different from other people's could also be important. Uh, Renas the Renaissance uh, idea of humanism began in Italy, right? Wen Yi Fu Xing, but it slowly spread across all of Europe. And the last place it happened was in England because England is the Western part of Europe. Um, and so this is when the idea of being English and using the English language started to have some importance and people started writing important things in English. And this is why we call this period the English Renaissance. In 1517, a very important thing happens. Martin Luther begins the Reformation in what is today Germany. Martin Luther begins the Reformation. Uh, so this is very important because at the time, religion is not just a personal thing. Religion is connected with politics, connected with the laws and rules of a country. So back in those days, the Pope, Zhao Zong, he's not just the person who gives speeches. He controlled an army. He uh, had great influence on the kings and queens of Europe. If you were a Catholic, you had to follow what the Pope says, even if you are a king. So when Martin Luther stood up and said, you don't have to listen to the Pope. In terms of religion, you only need a Bible and your own conscience. This was incredibly new. And incredibly dangerous. Because if power is connected with religion and Martin Luther says you can believe what you think is right, then why do you have to listen to the king? Why do you have to listen to the pope? So when Martin Luther started the Reformation, every country in Europe was against him. And the only reason that the Reformation could spread and uh, influence more countries is because everyday people uh, also thought that their kings were not good kings, that the Catholic religion had some very bad rules that they didn't want to follow. And Martin Luther gave them a reason and a way to escape that situation. So throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, all of Europe was fighting war over religion. Uh, so that's the background to what happens next. In the face of the Reformation, Henry VIII decided that um, religions can be dangerous. What if they uh, what if they obey the Pope instead of me? So uh, Henry VIII decides to exert more control over religion in England. And one thing he did is to destroy or end most monasteries, Shodaren. This is important for literature because in the Middle Ages, monasteries were where people uh, studied the past. If you needed a book, you usually go to a monastery. And before printing, in order to make a copy of a book, you had to actually write the whole book again. And it takes time and it takes effort. So there are not many books at that time and any books that there are are usually in a monastery. So when Henry VIII ended or destroyed monasteries, he didn't really care too much about literature. And so a lot of work was lost or destroyed. And this is one reason 
why a we don't have much literature from the Middle Ages in English. Uh, and then in 1534, Henry VIII suddenly decided, wait, maybe the Reformation can be a good thing. And he decides to break from the Catholic Church and to start his own Church of Christianity, which he called the Church of England. And this is Inguo Guojiao. Why did he change his mind? The answer is he hated his wife. And he wanted to get a divorce, Xiang Li Hun. But in those days, in order to leave your husband or wife, you had to get permission from the church. If you're a king, you have to get permission from the pope. The pope did not give him permission. So basically he said, fuck the pope. I'm the new head guy of the church. I can do what I want. And so he started the Church of England. Now, as you might guess, therefore, the Church of England is very similar to the Catholic Church. There's no reason for him to change a lot. He just needed to change two things. Who is the head of the church? And can you get a divorce? Everything else is basically the same. Um, now, today, the Church of England, after 500 years, is quite different from the Catholic Church but it is still a very traditional kind of religion compared to some of the newer, later uh, versions of Christianity. Okay, and then in 1558, he dies, and his daughter Elizabeth I becomes Queen of England. As a queen, she had to use a different strategy to control her country. So instead of just saying, I'm the queen, you have to listen to me, she also used the fact that she was a woman. And so most of the important people at court were men. So in order to control them, she also promoted the idea that she is a loving queen mother and that she is looking out for her children, the people of the country. So whenever she gives an order or she makes a decision, it's like a mother telling her children what to do. So she, she uh, fostered what we call a cult of love. Cult usually means uh, like me, jiao, but here it just means a, a belief system, a value system. So not just power, but also the idea of love. Um, and the men in this system, she encouraged to be chivalrous, to have chivalry. In Chinese, we call this qi shi jing shen. The key to chivalry is that you're not just doing things for yourself, you're doing things for the people you want to protect, the country that you want to serve. So it's in two directions, right? The queen mother takes care of her children, her men, children serve her and the country to protect them. And that's the system of power in the court of Queen Elizabeth. And this is one reason why a lot of the literature of the 16th century is about love. Sometimes it actually is about love, but other times it's talking about power using the language of love. And sometimes both. And we will be looking at some uh, poems that do this. In 1559, uh, Queen Elizabeth thinks, you know, there's starting to be more and more works of literature and also plays, drama, and some of this stuff can be dangerous, especially with the Reformation going on in Europe. Maybe somebody will print something and people will start to rebel against the government. This could be dangerous. So she started publication censorship, Now, in order to publish something, you first have to submit it to the government and the government will tell you whether you can or cannot publish. So this is the first time in British literary history that the government steps in to influence literature. Now it sounds like it's a very tight control, but remember this is uh, the 16th century. The government is not that powerful. 
So there are still lots of works that are outside the control of the government, but the most important works usually have to be approved. Um, so it's not just publication, however. At this time, as I mentioned, most things that are printed are for information, religion, politics. If it's literature, it was not taken seriously. People thought that literature was something you wrote in your free time and you don't do it for money. You do it to show how smart and wise you are for reputation. Uh, and so. If you only print inform important information. Then literature is not considered important, so most people did not publish, did not print their literature. In fact, they thought if you publish your literature, that means you think of this as the same as politics or religion. But in fact, they think of these two things as very different. So in, there was a stigma against print. It's like you're debasing anything that you print. So instead, most literature was written and passed around and performed instead of printed. Literature is a very social thing. Now, some people, um, their literature is so good that people want to support their literature. They want to show that this is something worth promoting. We want you to continue. And so some important people would hire writers, but not as writers. They would hire them in some other position and give them money to support them. But in fact, it was, it was because of literature. 某一个名义支付他薪水, this system is called patronage. The person who gives the money is the patron. So a lot of literature at this time, at the beginning, it will say this work of literature is dedicated to this important person. Uh, thank you for supporting me, something like this. And in fact, it would go further. Some new writers would try to win patronage and support. And they would say, this is dedicated to somebody. I hope you will support me. So that's the, the kind of literature that was going on at the court in the 16th century. In 1588, the Spanish tried to invade with their glorious armada, Guangjianzhui, and were defeated by the English Navy and a hurricane. Uh, this is a turning point in British history. Uh, in the 16th and 15th centuries, European countries started to explore the world. They started to think about long distance trade. And uh, the country that started is Portugal, because it was nearest the ocean. But right next to Portugal was Spain. So Spain was one of the most powerful empires at the time. By defeating the Spanish, the English showed the world that they too were an important and powerful country. And it really built up the reputation of the British Navy. It also helped Queen Elizabeth. Remember, she's a woman, so a lot of people at the time were worried. They thought, OK, she's not a bad leader, but what if we go to war? Can she win a war for us? And this showed the country that she can. When the news first arrived in England that the Spanish were going to invade, Queen Elizabeth went to the mouth of the Thames, to give a speech about how like the British were her children. She would never abandon her children. We were going to fight the Spanish together. And when and then when the Spanish did arrive, a huge storm came and destroyed their boats. And so Queen Elizabeth 
can say, not only did she win, God helped her win. And that really helped to strengthen her control over the country. Um, so now that the English were also on the high seas, taking part in uh, naval affairs and events, uh, the two important activities that they did on the ocean were voyages, and piracy, of course, at the time, it's not called piracy. It's called um, privateering. The idea is that um, if a boat can like defeat another boat and control that boat, it can take whatever is on the boat. It can take prisoners back to land and sell those prisoners back to their original country. And this money, most of it you can keep, but you give some of it to the government because the government is letting you do this. And, and it became a source of income for the government and for uh, sailors and captains. Um, and you might think, wait, that sounds illegal. Why did the other countries let England do this? And the answer is that uh, in those days, war was not illegal. War only became illegal in the 20th century. Uh, what does that mean? War is illegal. So like today, if one country invades another country, almost every other country will say you shouldn't do that. You should stop. If you don't stop, we will fight you, right? That's what it means to be illegal. In those days, if one country invaded another country and the first country won, everybody thought, oh, that's fine because you're stronger, so you can win. No problem. That's what it means for war to be legal. And so this kind of behavior, piracy, privateering, was seen as normal. If you were attacked by a, a pirate or a privateer, you were unlucky. If you lose the fight, you were not prepared enough. And uh, it's a sign that your country and your navy is weak. So that's what was going on in international politics. Now, the 1590s up to the 1610s, these 20 years are often considered the best years in English literature because you have the two greatest Playwrights, Christopher Marlowe, Ma Lu, he's number two, and William Shakespeare, who is, of course, number one. Um, now, why plays? Right? The most important literature at the time was poetry. So why are we talking about plays? And it's because plays at the time were a popular form of literature, popular as in everybody likes it, but also popular meaning for the population, 大众文学. The theater of the time is like TV today, very similar. You had uh, stories that were exciting, emotional, and easy to understand. These stories were not just written down once, but were written and rewritten by many different people at the same time. They were based on stories that most people already knew from history or from legends or from popular stories. And they were performed for everybody, high class, low class, royalty, nobody. If you had, uh, I think it was uh, five pence, 五分钱, you could enter the theater and watch your performance. And this is, uh, why this kind of literature was so important uh, in terms of literary history. Another reason it's important is because the government really did not like this idea that everybody would go to the same theater to watch the same shows. Can you think why this would be a bad idea for the government? First of all, 
What kind of stories are they watching? Do these stories support the government? Or do they complain about things? Secondly, when you say everybody, that includes small criminals, rebels, foreigners. And if everybody is in the same space, it's possible for ideas to spread. And thirdly, uh, the plague, when E, Black Death, Hesibing. When everybody comes together from different parts of the city to the same place, it's easier to spread disease. So all three points led the government sometimes to shut down a theater, sometimes to ban all theaters, sometimes to cancel a specific performance or a specific group of actors from time to time. And in terms of politics, there were always people writing essays against the theater, why it's a bad idea, why it will lead to corrupt morals, why it lead to disease, all these bad things. And yet the theater continued. And even the people who thought this could be dangerous also enjoyed going to the theater. That's how good uh, the theater of the time was. Now it's considered a kind of literature, so actors and playwrights were not jobs. It's not something you can live off of. You can't say to the government, my job is an actor. So instead what happened was acting troops together would seek patronage from somebody important, just like the other writers. They find an important person to give them money and give them some kind of job title. When in fact, the reason that they are being paid is to continue to write and perform. So for example, Shakespeare's company uh, started out the Lord Chamberlain's men. The Lord Chamberlain, sorry, the Lord Chamberlain is the person in charge of the buildings of the royal court, Gong Ting Guan Li Ren. Very important person. So he supported Shakespeare's acting group. Later, after Queen Elizabeth died and James I became king, Shakespeare's company was upgraded, promoted to uh, the king's men. The king himself supported Shakespeare's company because, you know, they were the best. Um, so this is the theater. The plays that they wrote and performed are very different from today's plays, mainly because they were all written in verse, ring one. It's a popular entertainment. Everybody likes to go. So they had to show many different plays to keep everybody entertained. And by many different plays, I mean they had to have eight different plays each week. It's impossible for anyone to remember everything. So they had to use some ways to help the actors remember. One thing they did is the plays were written in verse. Verse is easier to remember. Um, and if the actor forgets a line, they can use another line as long as it sounds like it should be in that spot. Uh, and the, the meter that they used, meter is the most popular meter of the time is called blank verse. Technically, this is iambic pentameter, sorry, unrhymed iambic pentameter. In Chinese, we call this bu ya ring wu bu yi yang ge. Bu ya ring, unrhymed. Yi yang ge, iambic. English poetry focuses on stress and unstressed. Qing ying zong ying. Iambic means unstressed, and then stressed. Dun dun. So, for example, let me read uh, from next week's poetry. You don't have to understand right now. Listen to the rhythm. Jiezhou. Uh, uh, 
and of some scent from that sweet enemy France. Town folks, my strength, a daintier judge applies his praise to slight, which from good use doth rise. Some lucky wits impute it but to chance. Dun 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 dun. That is iambic. Yi yang ge, xian yi zai yang, xian qing zai zong. And then finally, pentameter. Penta means five, wu bu. So in every line, there are five of these. Uh, da da, right? Da 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 da. That's one line. And this is the most popular kind of poetry at that time. And because this is the height of British literature, English literature, blank verse is considered the most important kind of poetry. Much later in literary history, people were still writing poems using blank verse. Um, aside from plays, the most popular form of poetry is the sonnet, Sang Lai Si, also known as the 14 liner, Shi Si Hang Shi. So, as you can guess, each poem has 14 lines, and there is a specific pattern. The fun of poetry is to see how you can use a limited number of words in a specific pattern to express different ideas. And so the poets of the 16th century had a great admiration for form, They enjoyed it when a writer was very clever about how they wrote poetry or plays, using a simple structure to express many different ideas. They loved that stuff. Um, and so when we read poetry from the 16th century, you can also pay attention to how do they use the meter, the gudu? How do they fit ideas in or spread ideas around the poem? Uh, we don't have enough time to read a play, even though the plays are the most important kind of literature from this period. If you're interested in plays, I'm also teaching Shakespeare this semester on Monday, and you can take that course. Uh, and then finally, in 1603, Elizabeth I dies. The next king becomes King James I. This is important because this guy is not just another family member. He was the king of Scotland. At the time, Scotland and England were two different countries. Now, England, is the Church of England, right? A Protestant church, Xingjiao. Scotland was a Catholic country, Tianzhuzhou. Remember, religion is politics. So a lot of people were very worried. Oh no, our new king is Catholic. Does that mean that he will like, uh, like kill all of the religious leaders? Does that mean we'll have to follow the Pope? What's going to happen? And so that period of time was very uh, shaky, and Thankfully, nothing too terrible happened. Somebody tried to blow up parliament, but they were stopped. We'll talk about that next time or in the next period, but nothing too serious. Uh, the bigger influence is that James had a very different idea of what it means to be a king. And that also uh, influenced the literature of the 17th century, but that's the next period. Do you have questions about the 16th century? OK, so I'm now going to introduce uh, next week's author. Sir Philip Sidney. Sir Philip Sidney is a courtier. He's a member of the royal court. Elizabeth loved him. He had a very colorful and exciting life. In terms of literature, he was the first master, sorry, the second master of the sonnet, Shi Si Hang Shi. Uh, he didn't just write individual poems, he wrote what's called a sonnet cycle. Sang Lai Si de Xi Lie Shi. And he, so each poem is about a similar idea, and put together, they kind of tell a story. The story 
uh, of his collection. Let's see. His sonnet cycle is called Astrophil and Stella. Astrophil is a guy's name. Stella is a girl's name. It's a love cycle. Uh, also, Astrophil and Stella. Stella means star. Astrophil means a lover of stars. Kind of smart, right? OK, so he tells the story of how they meet and what happens in their relationship and how the relationship ends. Not like a novel, right? Not a story, but like kind of from this direction and then from that direction in this event and in that situation. But you get a general picture of these two people. Um, the, the poems are almost all from the perspective of Astrophil, the guy. So Stella is just the object of desire. She's the woman he loves. She's the woman he wants to pursue. She's the woman who breaks his heart most of the time. It's a very male centered uh, poetry, which I'm sorry to say most of literary history is pretty male centered for obvious reasons. Uh, when women do appear, uh, when women do appear, I will tell you about them. So next week we're going to be reading five sonnets by Sir Philip Sidney Wojcikowski. Um, so before next week, please read up to page five. So you have sonnet forty-one, sonnet forty-seven, sonnet fifty-four, sonnet eighty-one, and sonnet eighty-seven. These five. Uh, the textbook sometimes has notes to help explain things. And also it has like these small circles. Sometimes you will see a, a small circle uh, near a word. And when you see a circle, that means that on the right side of the page is a modern English translation. So like on the right are simple translations and in the notes are things that need more explanation. Uh, if you get confused, I encourage you to use an English to English dictionary. I also encourage you to take notes while you read. It's easy to forget things. Write down what you learn, what you understand and so during the exam, if you need to find information, it would be much easier to find what you need. So read these five. Next week, uh, I'll divide you into groups. We'll talk about the discussion questions, and then I will introduce the next writer. Questions about anything? Anything at all? OK, see you next week.